Good morning, First Temple. My name's Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Hey to everybody watching online as well. Thank you for worshiping with us and joining with us this morning. We're continuing this series on vices and virtues. And today we're taking on envy. Envy. It's a fun one. Uh, I want to start with a confession. Uh, Recently, I was kind of scrolling through, you know, your feeds as you do, and there was a peer of mine, a friend, and I saw that they had gotten a promotion. And there was this feeling that I had in that moment of just kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe when you've scrolled through your feeds or as you've gone about your life and you've seen somebody have some success and you feel this kind of, does that relate to you? You know, and as I thought about it, I was like, why do I have this feeling? I don't want the job that this person has. <laughs> They're my friend. Like, I'm, I'm super happy for them and what they are achieving. And yet, I still have this kind of feeling of frustration, discontentment, something that bubbled up within me in that moment. And I'll tell you, it kind of made me mad. I was kind of mad at myself for having that feeling. I was like, man, I, I am happy with where I'm at. Life is good. Why? I am a follower of Jesus. Why do these feelings bubble up in me? Shouldn't I be farther along spiritually than having to deal with feeling like this. What bubbled up within me was, was envy. Not of a particular position or something like that, but just seeing somebody else have success for some reason in that moment made me feel like a failure. You ever been there? As you scroll, as you see the achievements of your friends from high school, or maybe the people you weren't friends with in high school, <laughs> As you see what's going on with other people's lives, people in your field, do you ever have that feeling? Today, as we look at envy, I hope that we discover that we can only be free from envy and able to live with kindness in this world when we accept our value as declared by Christ. Today, our goal is to figure out what envy is, figure out where it comes from, and figure out how we respond in the way of Jesus. So this series, Vices and Virtues, we've been looking uh, along with the church in Colossa. It's a young church, and Paul is writing to this young church and trying to encourage them and prepare them as they go about their lives, knowing that there will be all kinds of influences and challenges, and there are ways that they used to live that no longer fit with the new reality of how they are supposed to live as followers of Jesus. And so as he's giving some warnings and challenges, we see different lists of vices, things they must take off, ways of living that they must get rid of, and virtues, things that they might put on. And so we want to put up the, the grid of the vices and the virtues that we've been working through and we continue to work through. You see, we've got a vice, we've got a virtue, we've got a desire. And often when we talk about vices and virtues, it's often like, hey, don't do the bad thing. Okay, now do the good thing. Okay, go home. I'll see you next week, right? That's often how we talk about this kind of thing. But really what we want to do in this series is look at the vices and the virtues and realize that both of these things come out of our response to a root desire deep within us. A root desire deep within us. And so we see that envy comes out of this desire that all of us have, that God has given each of us for worth, for honor, to be valued. You want to be valued. All of us have that desire. And what happens is, when we aren't getting that worth and honor from God, we will respond with the vice of envy. As we try to fulfill that desire with things of the world, we will realize that they come up short. And we will begin to be envious towards one another. So first we're going to interrogate what envy is. And we'll start 
by going to our text in Colossians. So if you open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, it's on the screens as well. It's in our church app if you want to look there. We'll start in Colossians 3 verse 5. Paul says to these young believers, put to death, that is, starve. Remove whatever is feeding. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly. Fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Now you may be saying, I didn't see envy in that list. You're right, we're going to get to envy in another spot. But I wanted to remind you of that put to death language. That our challenge when it comes to these kinds of vice responses to our desires is to starve them, to put them to death. And there are lots of places where these vices show up. So I want to show you in the letter of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter is writing, and we find this other list of vices. It says this, Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile and all insincerity, envy and all slander. The word read yourself means to reject, put away, cast off. Get rid of envy. This is one of the places in the scripture where we discover this idea of envy being a problem. When we hear the word envy, I don't know where your mind jumps. Often we think it's about somebody has something that I want and I want to take it. Maybe that's how we think about envy. That's part of it. But there's a deeper meaning to it as well. See, just wanting stuff, that's greed. We talked about that last week. Envy is a little bit different. Because when we want to take something from someone else, it's not just because we want the thing. It's because what we see is that the thing that they have gives them some kind of value, we assume. We look at the thing that they have or the success that they have or the promotion that they've gotten and we think that's how they find value and worth and I want that value and worth. Envy is concerned chiefly with who we are. And so when we see other people's success, we say, I want that. Maybe if I just had that job, that thing, that accolade, that family, that vacation, maybe then finally my life would have meaning and value. In Rebecca DeYoung's book, Glittering Vices, she says this, Envy chafes at how another's superiority magnifies her own inferiority. Envy is seeing the success of someone else and it making you feel like a failure. One writer says it like this, Envy's trademark is that it wants everybody else to be as unsuccessful as you are. (laughs) Envy wants to hurt not just them, but you too. I brought a list with us uh, from DeYoung's book about symptoms that show up with envy. And before we read through this list, and it's kind of a long list, I want to challenge you, and I'm going to pray here in just a second, that as we read this list, we might be open to the Spirit of God nudging us a little bit if any of these areas might be things that we might struggle with from time to time, okay? This is not to beat anybody up. It's to help us kind of evaluate. So I'm going to pray for us. Holy Spirit, as we think about envy and as we desire to put it to death, to rid ourselves, God, we have to first understand what it is and notice when it shows up. So God, may you reveal to us Ways that envy has seeped into our lives. Amen. Here are some symptoms of envy. Feeling offended at the talent, success, or good fortune of others. Selfish or unnecessary rivalry or competition. Pleasure at others' difficulties or distress. Wishing others ill. Reading false motives into other people's behavior. We're getting closer belittling others, creating false accusations, speaking poorly about a person behind their back, gossip, antagonizing someone, scorn of another's abilities or failures, teasing or bullying, 
ridiculing a person. Prejudice against those you consider inferior or threatening to your position. All of these things come out of this false value where we want to be valued and we try to build it ourselves. It doesn't work. So then we lash out at others. Envy causes us to react to our own insecurity by harming other people and harming ourselves. The great writer Victor Hugo wrote this poem about envy, and I love this idea that he puts out there. It's this idea that envy, if it was like a person, a character in a story, envy, the person. And in the story, uh, envy stumbles upon like a genie in a bottle. You know how that works? And the genie comes out and says, I will grant you a wish. But here's the thing about the wish that I'm going to grant you, envy. I will give you anything you ask for. Ask for it and it will be yours. But here's what you need to know. Whatever you ask for, yes, I will give it to you. But I want you to know I'm going to give you your neighbor double. So whatever you ask for, it's yours. But just know your neighbor is going to get twice as much of whatever you ask for, okay? And envy says to the genie, fantastic, here's what I want. Make me blind in one eye. So then the neighbor will be blind in both. This is how envy takes us over. Willing to even harm itself just so that that other person can be brought down a pig or two. This comes from this root desire. And we can say don't be envious all we want, but we've got to understand where it comes from. We've got to deal with it. And that root desire is that within all of us we want to be valued. We want to feel worthy. We want respect. We want to be loved. And we can spend our whole lives trying to fulfill that need with all the wrong things. Stuff and success and promotions and vacations and social media profiles, we can try. It will never satisfy. It will just lead us to hurting ourselves and wanting to hurt others. Peter says, rid yourselves of envy. Say, well, Peter, that's easy for you to say. (laughs) You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know what other people are doing around me. See, the reality is our unhealthy views of ourselves and our value often comes from difficult things we've experienced, lies that have been told to us, The ways we've been mistreated. I realized that my envy bubbled out towards my peer because of a lie that sometimes I believe about myself. Maybe I'm not really cut out for this. (laughs) Maybe you have it too, this sense of imposter syndrome. Are they going to find out (laughs) that I don't know what I'm doing? Who am I? Maybe you experience that from time to time. This lack of self-value. How do I just get rid of that? It's deep, Peter. What do you know about it? Well, I think Peter might know a lot. The Apostle Peter was a follower of Jesus who um, made a few mistakes. No larger mistake, I think, could we point to than how he acted in Luke chapter 22. Jesus was taken to be crucified, and in Luke 22, starting in verse 54, it says this. I'm going to read it over you. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest, and Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard... They had sat down together. Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with Jesus. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, asserted, certainly this fellow was with him. I mean, he is a Galilean And Peter responded, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. 
And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now after Jesus is raised from the dead, he restores Peter, forgives him, and invites him to lead in his ministry. But do you think, as Peter continued on doing ministry in the early church, that he ever had imposter syndrome? Who am I to do this? Am I really valued? Do you think that maybe he envied the other leaders in the church who hadn't messed up so spectacularly and had it recorded in Scripture? (laughs) When we feel this root desire within us for value, but the only way that we've seen ourselves valued is negative, under the definition of value by the world, under the distortion of other voices, what do we do? Well, first, I would say if someone has hurt you or harmed you or impacted how you view yourself, impacted your ability to see how God sees you, I would encourage you to forgive them. And we'll see more about forgiveness as we read in the text. And that doesn't mean that forgiving them, you just Forget about it and go back into an unhealthy situation. No, do not do that. But it means you no longer let it have power over you. The way that they devalued you says a lot more about them than you. You can let it go. The God of the universe has something to say about you that is more powerful. You don't have to carry that anymore. Read yourself. See, when we find our own worth on our own claims of success or the things that we acquire, the way the world defines success, envy is inevitable. See, envy really comes when we refuse to believe what God says about us. Envy, as one writer says, is a dissatisfaction with the place in God's order of creation that we find ourselves in. Why did you make me like this, God? Perhaps we pray. De Young says it like this, the envious resent God. Feeling bitter towards others condemns themselves to a hell of their own making already on earth. If you are under this kind of false view of yourselves, forgive those who've put it there and then listen to what God says about you. If we're going to rid ourselves of this vice and put on the virtue of kindness, first we have to grasp with how God deals with the root desire. So go back to Colossians 3. We'll start in verse 12. It says this. As God's chosen one, holy, beloved, Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We have this desire for value, for honor, for worth. And look at what this scripture says. As followers of Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus, when you make him the Lord of your life, look at how he sees you. Chosen one. You, who I value, God says. Who I have made mine, God says. You are holy. It means to be set right. It means actually a saint, (laughs) You believe that by the power of Jesus you are a saint? Do you believe your spouse by the power of Jesus is a saint? Don't let it get to their head. Holy. That's how God sees you. Beloved. That word beloved 
It implies a past action. You who have been loved before and a continuing reality who are keep on being loved. I have loved you before. I love you now. I will keep on loving you. You are my beloved. That's what God says about you. And because this addresses that need within us for value, we can then respond by clothing ourselves Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness or gentleness, patience. God has been saying this kind of thing throughout history. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah records this. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through waters, I'll be with you. Through rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. You are precious in my sight. Honored, I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. God says, you are my beloved. I would pay any price for you. Now sometimes when we talk with this kind of language and about God's love for you, we can take that to mean that God is just super pumped all the time about however you are and however you act and you just keep on doing what you're doing. That's actually not what this means. God is not just saying, okay, I love you now, just keep on going. God is not doing what maybe you did in middle school when you signed yearbooks. I would often write, stay cool, don't change. (laughs) Now, that's not really love. The people who signed my yearbook like that, the people whose yearbook I signed like that, we didn't really know each other. (laughs) We're not still friends. (laughs) We don't really talk. They don't know me. God's love is different. He says, I love you just like you are, and I'm calling you to walk in a new way. This lack of value that you have for yourself, this envy that is hurting you and other people, it's killing you. I want you to be transformed. I don't want success to have you in chains anymore. I don't want this way of living to have you in bondage anymore. I love you too much for that. Let me rescue you out. This love has cost. As we respond to Jesus and seek to be more like him, we will have to sacrifice. We'll have to lay down our pride and our control and our stubbornness. We'll have to lay down some vices. But God says, I'll be with you the whole way. I have already rescued you. Come live with me. The greatest sacrifice, the greatest cost, has already been paid. See, God's love, which covers us, is most clearly demonstrated in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God would lay down his life for us, go through crucifixion for us. And then, as his people, he invites us to live in a new way. That's what this series is all about. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, you were washed. You were made holy. You were set right in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit of God. And then further down, you were bought with a price. Therefore, Because of what God has done for you, glorify God in your body. Rid yourself of these things. Put them to death. The old way of responding to these root desires, forget them. I love you too much to let you keep killing yourself like that. This is what God is saying to me and to you. He's saying to me in that moment of envy of a friend, I love you and have called you. What are you doing getting your worth 
from somebody's social media posts and the likes that they get. Put it to death. How do we respond? The first thing we must do is surrender to the cross. If you are trapped in this pain and bondage of envy and trying for success and success that will never fulfill, put it to death. Turn to Jesus. He has already paid the price for you. He will give you all the worth you could ever want or desire or imagine. Become his chosen, holy, beloved. All you have to do is confess that you need him and ask him to rescue you. As followers of Jesus, people who have already done that, how do we respond? Well, Colossians 3 says, put on kindness. Put on kindness. That simply means the art of of being a deer, as someone would say, of doing good for others. If envy is the desire to harm other people because we have a distorted view of our own self and value, kindness is the desire and the actions of doing good for others because we have a healthy view of ourselves in Christ Jesus. See, kindness flows out of us because we are already secure in our identity. What is there to compete about or gossip about or try to bring people down about? We've been set free. Put on kindness. The actions of kindness. See, kindness is this overflowing that happens from a healthy value of ourselves. But also as we do these practices of seeking out kindness, we remind ourselves of the value we have. It works together. It works like that in a marriage. Where when we are secure in our relationship, we are so much kinder to one another. We prioritize one another. And as we are kind to one another, we are reminded of our security in our relationship. My wife and I need that right now as we are dealing with twin babies and they are waking up at times that they should not be waking up at. And we have this standing apology. (laughs) Every morning, I'm sorry for the thing that I said when I was sleepy. (laughs) We seek kindness. We are kind to each other because we are secure in our relationship, but in our kindness, we remind ourselves, oh yeah, they're for me. They love me. Paul calls us to put on kindness. It overflows from our healthy identity, but it also maintains the identity we found in Christ. So what are some practical ways that we can put on kindness and starve envy? Well, whenever you feel that of envy, I want to challenge you. Usually we're envious about people that we know, people close to us, people who have the same career field as us, right? You're not usually envious about somebody way across the world that you've never met. You're envious about the person in the office over that has the new car. So whenever you feel that of envy, I want to challenge you to text or call, reach out to the person you're feeling envious about. As soon as you feel it creep in. I will tell you, as I was preparing this message and I wrote down that action step, I realized that meant I had to do it too. And so as I wrote down that action step to prepare to let you hear that action step, I then had to text the person that I had felt envious about and I encouraged them. And it reminded me that they are called by God and it reminded me that God loves them and it reminded me that they are a person and it reminded me that their success has nothing to do with me at all and we should just celebrate. Another action step I think that might help. If we're going to really address this root identity problem of how we value ourselves, what if we put scripture on our minds all the time? So when you don't feel so valuable... And when you believe the lie that it's really about how nice your car is or the promotion that you have or how many Instagram followers you have, instead, you might return to Scripture. So I'm going to challenge you to memorize this Scripture, Colossians 3.12. You can take a picture of it. You can write it down. Memorize it. Write it on your mirror. I don't know, however you want to do that. Put it somewhere where you'll see it. Put it on a sticky note on your laptop, right? 
so it'll be in your way. Put it on your dashboard. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And maybe you'll see that right before you want to gossip because you're envious. These are challenging things. But the reality is envy can seep in for all of us, and, and that's just part of being a human. But your real value, your real worth, was never in those things that the world tells us makes us important. It's always been on what Jesus said and has done for you. As we close this morning, I want to read over you this Colossians passage again, this time from the message translation. So, as those chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even temper, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and as completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would push each of us to be honest about our own struggles with envy and more honest about the deep desire within us for value that we often try to fulfill in all the wrong places. By the power of you, Spirit, will you help us believe what you say about us? Help us surrender to you and your call. And may we live as people in this world with those outside these doors, with those within our church family, even to ourselves, may we live with kindness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.